So hello everyone, my name is Shivani Garg Patel and I am Chief Strategy Officer here at the Skoll Foundation. I am so excited to welcome you to the second day of the Virtual Score World Forum um, and this session, Women Shifting Systems. Uh, this year, as you all know, our theme is Closing the Distance. And so we are really excited that we have, um, in partnership with Catalyst 2030, this session um, here today. Before we get to it, I'll just share a quick few quick logistical items. Um, this will be recorded and then we'll release it publicly after the event so folks across time zones can, can access it. Please join us in the chat, engage, ask questions, um, capture highlights from the conversation, and we are scheduled to end in 60 minutes. So after the session, before you drop off, please do take the survey that's in the poll tab um, in the right to the right of the hop in video screen. That's super helpful for us. And on social media, we're using the hashtag, hashtag SkullWF, so please do the same. So personally, I'm super thrilled about this conversation, as are many of you in the chat already. Having been a social entrepreneur before, I came to the Skull Foundation and experiencing some of the greatest challenges of my personal life. And at the foundation, we've tried to understand these challenges that women social entrepreneurs face and how we can tackle related biases and barriers in our work, and also the assets and skill sets that so often come from women social entrepreneurs. I look forward to learning about pathways for change from these amazing speakers. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Pavitra. Thank you so much, Shivani. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to one and all. My name is Pavitra Raja, and I'm from the Schwa Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship and the World Economic Forum. Um, and you know what, this is an absolute privilege to be hosting this conversation with such an esteemed panel. Look at this panel, wow. Um, I'm so pleased to welcome Cheryl Dorsey, President of Echoing Green, Diana Wells here, President of Emerita Ashoka, Gisela Solimos, co-founder and managing board member of Center for Nutrition Recovery and Education from Brazil here. Thank you for joining us. And Karima Kadawi, co-founder and executive president of Tamkin Community Foundation for Human Development. Thank you so much to you all for being here. Now, one thing that you all have in common, apart from being amazing and incredible and great speakers and, and powerhouses, is that, yes, I'm flattering you up, but really it is, it is a global <laughs> part of, um, of Catalyst 2030, which is a global movement of social entrepreneurs and social innovators from all sectors who share the common goal of creating innovative, action-oriented approaches to accelerate the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Catalyst 2030 has more than 600 member institutions and 900 individuals who are covering all the 17 SDGs, working with representatives in 190 countries, wow, um, touching over 2 billion lives. So um, if you want to learn more about Catalyst 2030, go to Catalyst2030.net. And thank you so much again uh, for having me host this panel. Um, now, I know what some of you are thinking having joined this panel. Now, it's 2021. Are we still talking about gender inequality? Um, and that, yeah, I mean, I share your frustration. Why haven't we solved this yet? Why are women still living with it? And why is society still perpetuating so many of these inequalities? Now, according to the World Economic Forum Gender Gap Report that was launched in 2021, so it's a very recent report, it will take 135.6 years to, to close gender gap worldwide. That's a staggering statistic. And I'm not done yet. Globally, we have actually taken a step backward from parity. Gender gap in political empowerment remains one of the largest, with only 22% close today. In economic participation opportunity, um, the gap will take nearly 267.6 years to close. Very specific statistics, but you know, take take that, take a minute to, to let that sink in. It's also well documented uh, that COVID-19 pandemic hit women harder. The situation for racialized indigenous and disabled women is even worse. Women in social entrepreneurship often disrupt many of these patterns of gender, gender inequality. Women social entrepreneurs like the ones we have here have time and time again made deep impact in their work, overhauling unfair and unjust systems, sparking collaborative social movements and reshaping dominant expectations. But why do the disproportionate barriers for women social entrepreneurs still exist in the sector? What are they exactly? Why do they exist? And what do we do about them? So, Cheryl, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you've had an illustrious career as a social entrepreneur and a thought leader in this space as well. If I may, what are some of the structural problems in the social innovation ecosystem that lead to such disproportionate barriers for women's social entrepreneurs? Uh, thank you. 
Vitra. Couldn't imagine um, being with a finer group of leaders. So excited to, to be joining my fellow panelists. Really excited to get into this conversation. Um, and I, you know, will just give a bit of context. I have mostly come at this work through the lens of um, racial equity. Um, it's a very intersectional conversation for me that really sort of is forged at the nexus of both um, race and gender and class. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, it's very hard to disentangle it. A number of folks might be familiar with some recent uh, research that Echoing Green did with our partners at Bridgeband, where we were looking at a form of oppression, structural racism, but it applies equally well um, to issues around patriarchy and gender inequity um, and sort of the underlying drivers that show up uh, that prevent women social innovators and others from sort of thriving um, really come down to the guiding forces of of conceptions around risk, bias with dimension, whether it's implicit or explicit. Fundamentally, this becomes a question around power, right? Who has it? Um, how do you think about sharing it? Ultimately, how do we think about seeding it um, to make for a more equitable, inclusive world? Um, so I think those are predicates for having this conversation. And I think it sort of shows up day to day through a lot of the funding and equities that I know we can all speak um, to equally eloquently. I mean, I go back to this intersectional lens. Um, you know, when you we've invested in a number of terrific social innovators um, who are focused on sort of diversifying sort of the investment ecosystem for folks of color. Um, and I was looking at some research um, from one of our fellows, Catherine Finney from Digital Undivided, who noted that the average female-owned black startup raises only about thirty thousand dollars in seed funding versus an average startup, which raises about $5 million. So look at that structural inequity, it's stunning. And I was talking to a terrific young social innovator last week who was trying to increase the number of girls and women of color coming into STEM field. And she's really focused on raising money from um, corporate leaders. And she noted that there are about 32 companies, mostly in tech, that collectively have about 500 billion in revenue, um, throw off about 500 million in giving. Only 5% of that is focused on women and girls in tech. Less than 0.1% of that goes to women and girls of color in tech. So again, the numbers just sort of amplify the structural equities that we all talk about. So I'll stop there, but it's a big, a big hill to climb for us. So you brought up such interesting points that intersectional lens, and I'd love to come back to that point. Maybe we would dem demystify that concept a bit for some of the other people who are watching and also uh, how I can read is taking that lens. So we're going to come back to that. But Gisela, I want to now move to you. Um, you have, again, also had an illustrious career as a social entrepreneur uh, and from Brazil too. You know, I actually, while listening to our conversation we had last week as we prepped for the panel, you said some incredible things and also made me think of a quote from one of our other social entrepreneurs uh, in, in the Twelve Foundation community. Who said a man who leads uh, a non for profit is considered heroic or enlightened, whereas I've been patronized numerous times as a charity worker. And that comes from Christine Pearson, founder and chief executive officer of Lifeline. So uh, I'm curious to see how much do you resonate or not resonate with that word? What are the barriers that you face from coming from Brazil, coming from Latin America? And again, thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Pavitra, and all of you. It's a pleasure, a massive honor to be with all of you. I'm really, really, really happy and excited about this, this meeting. Well, uh, I, I do resonate with Christine's uh, statement, uh, Christine's words, uh, also because if, we, uh, uh, first of all, I've never considered myself a social entrepreneur, okay? And I've just started calling myself like that after I won the uh, Schwab Award that I did not inscribe myself. I was inscribed by one of my, my, my employees. She said, oh, you should do it because you do have the profile. I said, oh, I do not have the profile. So she did it. And then, and then I did it with her because then the, 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 the following phases were more difficult. So of course I, I, I joined. And, uh, and when I won, I was told, I actually I realized I was the first woman to win the award in Brazil by herself. Uh, before that, there was another woman, um, Susana Padua, but it was she and her, and her husband. 
and uh, and so uh, yeah, first of all, I did need, did not see myself like that. And when I joined Schwab, and especially when I joined Ashoka, and I started to to join to see to meet these fellows, I realized. I mean, I, it's like I found. I said, "Whoa, there are other people in the world that are like me. <laughs> all the struggles, all the difficulties, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And this was very good. But on the other hand. Uh, I, I, there were very few women in all these environments, especially, I mean, the international environments, all the courses I have attended in Harvard, uh, education, wonderful courses, very few women, none of Latin America, okay, from Mexico down, the first course I went to Harvard, there was just me, okay, so, um, and then this is one thing, the other thing is that I, I have struggled all my career up to now uh, in terms of asking for funding and uh, proving what you're doing, uh, giving accountability of, of what you're, you're doing. It's like, there's like, a, I don't know if it's like a prejudice or is the way women communicate. We are more gentle, more responsive to questions or whatever. Uh, but the fact is that um, I, during my career, I realized I would, I would, deliver much more things than and then add other organizations or or and but I do not I did not advertise them and I did not uh, because I was very committed to to uh, get to the point and to serve the people I was serving more than than advertising so uh, I, I think there are a couple of challenges and and maybe this this is due to a certain culture to a certain way what we consider that our results or I don't know success in this in this area, but uh, I, I stop here because I think maybe Diana or the others can help more on this on this aspect. Thank you so much. You said so many things there that we need to unpack. Uh, you talked about mindset, the narrative, women holding themselves back. You know, another interesting thing is do women hold each other back as well? In your case, someone from your organization put you forward. That's wonderful. But I've also seen women hold each other back. Is that because we're in a patriarchal society? What's going on here? And I, I really I really want to unpack a lot of what you said a bit more. But yes. But she was a woman oh, she, who put me forward, but she was a woman. <laughs> I assume so. I assume so. But, you know, I didn't want to say since then the Schwab Foundation community has had so many incredible Latin American um, so social entrepreneurs who are women join. And we're very, very grateful that you joined the community and brought that shift. Um, Diana, I'd like to move uh, over to you and ask you uh, a question around Ashoka and, and this really incredible study that you guys uh, put together in 2018. Um, and it, this was generally this work of Ashoka. And I'm just going to read some of the some of the things that we found that you found was um, uh, the study said that women are uniquely capable of uplifting the lives of other women, families, and communities. Now, could you tell us a little bit about what you found around this? Um, also, some of the gender-specific challenges that you found with your uh, female fellows, and um, also some of the impact models. I'm asking a lot of questions here uh, because this study was so interesting because it not just found the impact of women social entrepreneurs, but also the specific challenges that they face, and also this concept of deep impact so, uh, and deep scaling. I'd love to hear a bit more about what you found. Sure. So one of the barriers that I think we need to address is redefining success and what the success of, a, of social entrepreneurs are. And that will help all social entrepreneurs, but also women social entrepreneurs. And I'll get to the study in a minute. We, you know, uh, as early as the 1990s, part of my work at Ashoka has been to seek to define how we know when systems change happens. And what we know, one thing we do know is that we can't simply count direct service work. And I'll give you an example. Early Ashoka fellow in Bangladesh, Soraya Huck, um, started an organization called Fulki, where she was enabling women to stay in the workplace and care for their children by creating um, daycare centers inside a garment factory. She started with one factory. We could count the women that she kept employing and we could count the children who were able to see their mothers and continue breastfeeding. And But what soon happened was she was asked to build it in another factory, in another garment factory, and then it jumped industry. Her work reached an end game. 
because she had flipped the system. Others copied the idea. Now, if we were looking at this from a business lens, it would be a failure. But for the social entrepreneur, it's a complete success. It's a complete win. And Soraya can go on to do the next thing, which she did. And so we have to, for social entrepreneurs, define what is systems change. In this case, it was changing industry norms. It's scaling, the idea scaled up because it's changing industry norms. It could be policy change. And we found that women were achieving policy and legal reform at, in this 2018 study at similar rates as male fellows. What was different in the way that women were scaling their ideas is that men tended to scale out geographic spread uh, similar to what one would think of in a business case, right? Scaling operations, scaling geographically. But what we found women were doing more of was this concept of scaling deep, changing mindsets, changing cultural norms. It sort of makes common sense because women across the globe still are doing more culture change. In anthropologists, and I'm an anthropologist, talk of women's work as cult cultural reproduction, or raising the next generation of children, even if you're, they're not your own children. Um, so the cultural reproductive work of society is generally done by women. So changing norms and mindsets goes along with the way that women work. It also creates change over generations. So again, if you were just counting direct service work, it's time bound and it's, it's, it's limited. It's not counting the, the generations for the future in any particular way. Ashoka's work and my colleague Iman B. Bars, uh, who founded our uh, Ashoka Arab World uh, has launched uh, a program at Ashoka called and Movement Women in Social Entrepreneurship. And it is looking at this data. It's looking at uh, stories of, of the way women scale. We need all kinds of scale. <laughs> And uh, I think there's no better example than the founder of Catalyst 2030, Jill Bilmoria, <laughs> Jeru Bilmoria, who uh, is an Ashoka Fellow, a Schwab Fellow, and a School Fellow, um, who has done all of these. And she's also done something that, that popped up in, in our study, which was for women social entrepreneurs working with young people, they were putting young people in charge at a higher rate than their male counterparts were. And if I'm not mistaken, Jeru started her first social innovation at age 11. Um, and uh, Catalyst 2030 is, is her fourth or fifth. I've lost count. But in eight, each case, it's a, each, it's a beautiful story of scaling deep because, she, you know, Ashoka found her when she was beginning Childline, creating a helpline for our young people. And that idea took off across, last time I heard it was over 100 countries. Um, that wasn't enough because she recognized young people needed financial literacy. So again, going the next step and going deeper. And when that wasn't enough, she realized she needed to change policy across nations so that young people could open bank accounts and now catalyst so it, with each end game comes a deeper initiative and that's what i think of as scaling deep and thank you to iman b bars um, for helping us understand this and pulling out the data iman's uh, article in the social innovation journal issue 52 uh, describes this concept of scaling deep well I'll stop there. So much, Diana. That concept of scaling deep 
That is so interesting, and we need to unpack that a little bit more. I see that uh, Dr. Iman Bibar is also on chat here, and thank you so much for joining us. And a big shout out to Jeru, who is, as always, as wonderful and changing systems uh, globally. Um, and thank you to you, Diana, for some very important and interesting reflections. I'm going to come back to you um, as well. But at the moment, I'd like to turn to Karima, who is also joining us here today. Karima, thank you for being here. Um, now, we had a very interesting conversation last week. Um, you prep for this panel. I learned so much from you. Um, and also to look at this entire concept a little differently. Um, when, I, when we asked you what are some of the barriers that we're not talking about here, you said, um, are we spending too much time talking about barriers um, and, in, and, and, and too much time engineering change? So I'd love to hear a little bit about your thoughts around this notion of are we, are we, talking about it? Are we being too mechanical about it? Uh, and, and thank you for joining us as well. Mm, thank you, Pavitra. It's such an honor to be here. Um, I was delighted by our last meeting. I was actually, I came up that meeting with so much hope, um, such a beautiful resonance we had coming from so many different perspectives. So I'm so honored and delighted to be here with you. Um, I went back to the question, Pavitra, and, and, I, and I stuck with the words barriers. Um, and I thought, well, uh, it made me think of the Rumi poem who said uh, our task is not to go out to look for love, but to look for the barriers we've put on our heart to stop love from being. Because that is where it is, really, in our hearts. And, and what if we looked at it, everything like that? What if we stop looking for things that are outside of us, but rather come back to what are the barriers we've put there? So if we were going to talk in terms of what are the barriers women have, um, I would say that the barriers I experience are the barriers that first I've put on my heart. And then those barriers that I've put on my heart, um, when I realize that I've put them there, maybe I can realize that others have put them there also. And that does not only apply for women, but it applies for men. And maybe it's because of that, because we are not allowing ourselves to get in touch with, um, with ourselves with the humanity that defines us and connects us. Um, so it's looking at it in a different way. Rather than saying, looking at the man and the woman and saying, comparing, to say, what is making this man um, expressing this humanity this way? That makes women say, well, we want to be treated like him. But really, do we really want to be treated like him? How does he treat himself? How does you humanizing? It is to think that your value is what you produce, that your value is being better than someone else. How dehumanizing it is. So aren't we all together falling into the same trap rather than going deep like Diana says, and I love what you're saying, Diana. And I love what you said, Gisela, when you said the gentleness. There is a gentleness. You allow yourself to be gentle because yes, we are women, we work, we have children. We expect it to be gentle. But then we go to work, we compare ourselves men but we still hold on to that gentleness and it kind of spreads out and Cheryl absolutely when you go and you talk about racial equity it is the same thing it's about the barriers we've put in our hearts so if we go deep like the invitation Diana is inviting us to go to let's go there let's go deeper let's look at how all these societal manifestations of societal disharmony of human suffering, really as of, um, yes, being experts at creating dehumanizing systems, being expert at creating dehumanizing schools and organizations. But instead of looking what that school needs, let's do the opposite. Let's take away the barriers for letting the school be the school it wants to be, be the community it wants to be, be itself. So that is my first resonance to, to the question. So beautiful, Karima. Um, you are, you're inviting us to essentially question everything that we do, question the question. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm prepared to, to tackle that just yet. I'm, I'm sure my expert panel is here. <laughs> so, um, and I might, I might go back to you, Cheryl, um, because you brought this very important uh, point about intersectionality. Um, and I'm just going to try and it's going to be very difficult to encapsulate all of these incredible conversations for me. So bear with me. 
um, as, I, as I try to. Um, Cheryl, you brought up intersectionality. So firstly, I want to understand what does that mean? Um, because the filler, it's a concept by Kimberly Crenshaw. It's girl science, sort of interesting and new. How does it apply to the space? Um, a lot of what Karima talked about is just letting people be. How does intersectionality let just let us be? Um, and also, um, how can the how can we use that as a lens to create that shift that we need to, to address the barriers? I'm asking a lot of you, Cheryl, but you know the only person that can deliver is you. So, <laughs> Cheryl, you're you're on mute, um, and we'd love to hear you. Thank you. I am. I was enjoying the conversation, so I've got to get my head back in the game, but this has been wonderful. So I'm simply channeling the great Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, um, who 30 years sort of 30 years ago really introduced this concept of in intersectionality. And it's sort of a long word, but a very simple premise. It's essentially a lens or a prism for seeing the ways in which various forms of inequality often operate together and both compound and exacerbate one another, right? So we far too often tend to talk about racial inequality as separate from inequality based on, say, gender or even class or immigration status or sexual orientation. Um, the key is that, you know, what we often forget is you cannot compartmentalize these things that some people, some of us are subject to a few or all of these, um, and we experience um, the totality of these different identities. Um, and sort of recognizing that is incredibly important for how sort of the weight of systems, for how you are impacted within the systems that you uh, navigate. And I think, you know, rightly so, Professor Crenshaw has really been a seminal voice and leader um, in this space. But um, you know, going back to my initial analysis and point about power, I think we have not given enough credence to um, scholars like Cheryl Harris, who I think is now at UCLA, um, but almost over 20 years now ago wrote a seminal article for Harvard Law Review where she introduced the idea of um, whiteness as property, right? So she basically looked at whiteness, an attribute, and you, I'm asking you all to insert patriarchy in place of whiteness. So let me walk through this theory where she really talked eloquently about whiteness um, as, as a form of property that allows you to enhance your ability to accumulate wealth and material items through the dispossession of others, right? She sort of centered this right at the nexus of law and property. Um, and it's the way that across the globe, not just in the United States where I'm currently joining you all from, but across the globe where um, property has conferred all sorts of benefits from citizenship to voting rights to other privileges. And I think it is a brilliant crystallization and frame for how we think about sort of patriarchy and how it shows up for women through the lens of gender and opportunity. And it goes back to how sclerotic and how difficult it is to um, get around these structural inequities and these barriers um, that show up time and time again. And I just think we're in a moment where we've got to sort of courageously take them on um, if we are ever to get beyond it. And I'll give you one last example. You know, there was some interesting research that came out of Pew that looked at um, how Americans viewed their political leaders. And quite honestly, when you look at the data and you go deep and you look at the crosshats, there really is no difference um, on how folks view men versus women leaders in the political realm. They think women are better at some sorts of uh, types of political leadership, men are better, but overall they're looked at the same. But when you look at female representation in our political system, it is so reduced relative um, to our population um, percentages that you've got to go back to these structural inequities um, that have got to be dismantled brick by brick if we're ever going to get to the place um, where more social innovators, uh, women social innovators can do the work that they need to do. So again, just a plea um, that these things um, are um, have a long tail, have a long history, um, and to really understand how we make progress, we've really got to have a clear-eyed analysis of them. And I can, if I can probe you just a little bit more, um, 
what would be the one shift that you would want to see or what's the one shift that Echoing Green is trying to make? You've talked about intersectional lens. You've talked about this incredible research um, by Cheryl Harris. But if it was up to you, what was the one thing that you didn't want to see in this space? <laughs> I know. And again, this is where you hate me as the moderator because I'm not going to answer your question and I should, um, but I can't because there's not one thing, right? Sort of folks who really sort of study um, systems of oppression know that they happen at multiple levels, right? There's the institutional level at the systemic level. There's also the interpersonal mediation, whether it's sort of the assumptions that folks make about you because of your gender, because of your race, as well as, um, you know, sort of discrimination, which is not about assumptions, but about actions and how they land on us. And then the last piece is how do we internalize these messages that come to us as women, as people of color? So you got to take them on at all levels. Um, so uh, it, it's being intentional. It's being fearless and relentless, and it requires a collaborative, mutual approach where we've all got to come at this from many different levels, taking it on collectively. Amazing. And yes, you didn't answer my question, but you answered it even better than I was expecting. So thank you so much. Um, Gisela, I'd like to move on to you. Um, you mentioned some things around your own personal experiences, your own barriers. Um, and I want to ask you, as a social entrepreneur, um, someone who's still shifting systems in Latin America, um, similar question as I asked Cher Cheryl, uh, where do you think the shift needs to happen? Now, Cheryl has talked about this entire ecosystem, but you've been on the ground, uh, as for your own personal experiences, what is it language? Is it organizations? Is it where do we start is probably my question to you. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> After Sarah, what can I say? I mean, <laughs> maybe as a psychologist, I can go to the person. <laughs> and so I, 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 I give a different perspective, a different point of view. And in my case, um, using, using my personal experience as, as something to help us to, to go deeper, <laughs> to scale deep. Um, I, I would say that in my case, it was, was the encounters I had in my life. Uh, first of all, uh, to build the organization I, I have built, I, I, it was a, com a companionship, a friend helped me too. And they would say, oh, you go there, you do it. I mean, I, said, I, I would say, I, I, I'm not able to, I'm not the best qualified. And the answer would be, yeah, you are, may, might not be, but we don't have anyone else. And this made me to go for it. At the same time, talking about uh, being a, a woman, a social entrepreneur, um, as I, I said before, to, to see other people that would face the same challenges, the same painful situations, the same loneliness, because it's a very lonely uh, um, position to be the leader of anything. And, uh, and then to see women living these things, uh, I would say, oh, <laughs> uh, now I understand. And to be able to understand is very important. To be able, and you understand who you are when you are in front of someone else that looks at you and says, you are like this. I mean, you are capable or not capable. That's what Sherry was telling before. I mean, we have prejudices. There are people who, who look at us and say, you are not capable. And, and then, which is a lie, I mean. So I'm, I'm, I mean an encounter where someone looks at you uh, for what you truly are. And, and I found this, I had friends who did this with me and helped me to put this uh, work to this, to, uh, this uh, entrepreneurship that I, I did. But also when, when I, there were, I was, Ashok and Schwab helped me to, to, to meet other fellows and so to understand all the challenges and all the potential. And then, and also it was very funny to, to reinforce the intuitions I had. For instance, the way I would manage my staff, the way I would try to fundraise, the way I would organize my organization. It was very interesting for me to, to, um, to, to see these people. And also when I went to Harvard and they would give names to the things I was doing. <laughs> and this empowers one one person so uh if we we would be able to in this system Cheryl was talking before uh, 
uh, provide situations where children, since we're little, they could be looked by by what they are, by the beauty that they are, the everything that and 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 also to recognize our limits because we are not perfect and we don't need to be we just need to know who we are and that's that's okay because then when you recognize your limits you 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 go and look for help that's it's simple like that so um i would say that uh, uh, for instance in schools or even in our social businesses and entrepreneurships uh if we do what we are doing providing situations where where we provide true encounters like these beautiful um, encounters that allow us to to recognize who we are by what but by who we are not by being woman or man but by being gentle and even being gentle you are able to do an enterprise and or even if you're tough you are also able to to be gentle in your own way and so forth I think maybe the, the big the big problem we have is that in society we try patterns that are given to us from outside, even physically or how, however, and uh, we should be able to should be helped to look to accept and to embrace uh, how we are. Sentiment. And you covered so many interesting and important points, the notion of well-being, the notion of community, the notion of making sure that you identify with yourself and you know who you are to be able to make that change. Um, the importance of being recognized by peers, the importance of being in a circle where you can learn from each other, the importance of doing and worrying about the words later. You know, Harvard can do a study later, but first we may need to create that change. So you covered so many interesting and important things. Um, and I, I love this notion of what you said towards the end is that we fit into patterns that is already out there. And it's a really interesting article in The Economist actually that came out last week about how um, we as people of color or women of color, or we fit into patterns that have, created, that have been created by white men. Now, I, it's, I'm not gonna go into The Economist article too much, but that's what it kind of reminded me of. And I have a question for you, Diana, based on this, is when we're talking about patterns, uh, when we talk about this notion of success, who is defining this concept of success? Um, that women and women of color have had to fit into. And I have a question after this as well, but I think mm -hmm. the next round, but I'm curious to understand who is the one defining this success? Well, I think we get to define success. I mean, they, and the social entrepreneurs can define success. You know, I think sometimes the term entrepreneur makes think people think of business. And so there's been a, the, the we have we have uh, been put inside the box of business success, which you know I, when I, I I think I sought to, I tried to give an example of why that doesn't fit for what a social entrepreneur seeks to do. If a social entrepreneur wants as many people to get their idea and solution as quickly as possible, they're not driven by owning IP and, you know, a bottom line profit margin. Um, that That's not what defines a social entrepreneur um, in Ashoka's definition. So the measures must be different. And, uh, you know, I, there, um, there have been a couple of questions in the chat about scaling deep and, you know, wanting to hear more. One way to think about that is an example after example, you know, and Jeru Bill Moria is one uh, first book and Kyle Zimmer in the US is another where having set up a distribution channel for one particular service, it become there you have you can use that distribution channel for a series of next things so for Kyle Zimmer and first book, it was putting the first book into the hands of um, a young person who didn't own a book and that would create a, a cycle of a lifelong reading and learning. Now that distribution channel is being used to distribute um, disaster relief medicine, all kinds of, of things once that network is in place. So 
scaling deep being an opportunity to moving ideas and solutions to change norms and behaviors and culture layer after layer after layer more deeply. The one other point, you know, I think social entrepreneurship has created an enormous opportunity for women to lead. It, when we look back over our 40 years and our nearly 4,000 social entrepreneurs, it's a 40-60 split of women to men. You know, if we look at parliament where it's, you know, at this, the statistics I cited earlier, we, we need to do better, uh, but there has, but there's no doubt that women social entrepreneurs have had enormous impact. The fact that it's not, that social entrepreneurs aren't driven necessarily by brand. You know, I used to get questions uh, frequently, give me an example of a social entrepreneur who's gotten as big as Google. Well, I have a couple <laughs> in mind, but people don't associate them with uh, the term social entrepreneur. So Florence Nightingale, who we were at her 200th birthday and people are talking about her now, but anytime any of us have gone into an urgent care we have her to thank for popularizing this idea of medicine, which is something that she developed in the middle of the Crimean War to care for soldiers. You know, there is not a plaque or any branding inside of any urgent care facility, but it was her idea and practice that was taken up and is part of how medicine and healthcare is delivered globally. So again, uh, it, it, we're moving away from uh, something that's guarded with IP and, and a brand to an accelerated spread of ideas. And so and I could see your internet was a bit sketchy, but we, we got the most of what you were saying. Thank you so much. Um, I, I have to, uh, by, uh, by the way, do you give a quick shout out to Francois Bonici, who's here, who's the head of the Schwab Foundation, uh, encouraging all the men to be part of this conversation. And I have to say, this is as much of a conversation for men as it is for women. Um, and the notion of scaling deep applies to men too. It's not that they don't scale deep, they do. It's just women happen to do it and it's, it needs to be recognized. So um, thank you again to all the men who joined this conversation. We need you as allies um, as well. Um, Karima, I'm gonna turn to you quickly um, and a similar question is, uh, given the challenges that you've described and, and all the others have talked about as well, where do you think the shift needs to happen? Um, when we last spoke, you talked so eloquently about language and mindsets and narratives. And I'd love for you to delve a bit deep on, on especially that piece on narrative, um, if you could, in the, in the most eloquent way as you do. I wasn't able to unmute. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Pavita. Um, I think I, I will I will not answer, I'll rather give an answer of young people from a neighborhood community uh, Temkin has a partnership with. Um, a young woman who said, let's not blame our community, our environment, let's develop it. And a young man who told us that uh, Yesterday, we were in the cafe with other young men, and we were talking about some violence that happened in our neighborhood. And we were talking in a, about in a way that surprised us. And now we were wondering what had happened, and we realized that for two years, we haven't had the experience of violence, whereas before, we experienced it almost every week. And it, when we talk about violence, it's really high violence. And he said, but what has happened? He said, we started reflecting. Before we used to get together, we had to fight the next door neighborhood. We would define an objective, a strategy. We would find the resources. We would share 
the tasks. And what brought us together was violence. Today, what brings us together is love. He said, so what has changed? He said, the people are the same. The streets are the same. The neighborhood is the same. Nothing has changed and everything has changed. In fact, it is the relationship that has changed. It is not that love was not in a community, but the expression there was, was an expression through our violence. So here we're seeing what is shifting. Actually, it's more than a shift. It's at the level of the sense of self. How do I feel myself? And that how do I see myself? How do I see the other? But then he finished his story by saying, and now we've realized that all these community initiatives that we are co-creating, all these community projects that we are co-creating are only here, are only become an excuse to remain together. Isn't that extraordinary? Where's the shift of attention here? Where's the focus? Is it in doing things together? Or is it in being together? And through that being, through the quality of that relationship, through taking out those barriers, everything becomes possible. And that is what Temkin is about. Temkin is we're learning together to co-create a safe place where our human potential, in can, our human potential can express itself. And then all becomes possible, Munkin. That is the shift. So let's imagine now together, and this is what our experience, what we experience with the neighborhoods, we are experiencing in the education system. I've been told you are making us see the education system in a way that we've never seen it this way. What does it mean to learn together to see with different eyes? It's the same people, the same schools, the same curriculum. Everything has changed. And let's go back to what Gisela said to be recognized, to be seen. And that is actually to learn to realize the beauty of being a human being, of connecting deeply. Let's go back to the, what you were saying, Diana. What is this deep impact? It's deep connection, deep human connection. And this is something we know how to do. I don't need to be trained. We just we need to learn together to allow ourselves to do that. We had a young man at the university who said, today I'm here with you and I'm in the future. And I'm in the future and I'm building the future. I might go out from this workshop and go back to the present and go back to the past that brought this present. But when I come back and I'm with you, and my peers in my university, I'm in the future and I'm building the future. Well, that was the first workshop we had. Now you go back to that faculty and everything has changed. Yet nothing has changed. The relationship has changed. The relationship with the dean, with the professors, the relationship to the environment, how we feel our community. This young woman from the neighborhood community who told us, I have learned that in my community, I learn. But isn't it wonderful just to reflect in the depth of that? If I learn that in my community, I learn, that means I can decide with my community members what I want to learn. Then we become from a community that is learning, that it can learn. We become a community-based learning ecosystem and it diffuses because the moment I experience that, I shine that. And finally, I just want to finish with a final quote from a student from the high school who said, I saw the light in myself. And when I saw my light in myself, I want everyone else to see it. 
And whatever endeavor, whatever they do, if I don't know what they do, I am part of what they do. That connection goes far beyond we could even fathom. When we experience it, we want everyone to experience it. That is what shifts systems. And then the different communities who experience what it means that in my community I learn, what it means seeing the light and the beauty, that we are able to realize the beauty of what it means to be a human being. Societies, societies undergo a process that we might call societal metamorphosis. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because the way I see myself makes me realize the beauty of being myself and the beauty of being connected to others is deep. We might not hear it, we might not see it, but it's silent transformation. The same kind of transformation that when we age, it's, it's happening, right? But we don't realize it's happening. And then suddenly we say, and this is exactly what is happening with the Temkin process. This is what we're experiencing and this is what we're witnessing. And as an organization, we are in the process ourselves. We are that metamorphic niche that is experiencing that transformation, that deep transformation. Uh, you have rendered me speechless, uh, which is very rare, um, especially what my friends would say that that's very rare. Um, it's beautiful, the notion of metamorphosis in the social innovation ecosystem, to see the light within ourselves, to recognize that we are forever learning and share that learning with each other share that light with each other. That is so beautiful. And thank you so much, Karima, for sharing that with us. Um, I'm also being mindful of time. We've got nine minutes left, and I have one very important question to ask all of you, um, which is we've, we've unpacked a couple of things here, albeit not as deeply. We haven't scaled deep dive today. Um, that's something that we'll have to do at the next conversation. But one thing that we, you've all touched on is that we need a new definition of success in social innovation in the social change sector. Um, now, I want to ask, ask each of you, and maybe I'll shift the order around a little bit. Maybe we'll start with you, Diana, because you're first on my screen. Um, to you, what is this definition of success to you, if you were to redefine it? Maybe one or two things that you would include. And if I may uh, add another point here, how do we concretely achieve that, not to make it very difficult for you? Mm -hmm. To say it succinctly, I would say it's something that we've seen and learn from our social entrepreneurs. And that's to ensure that everyone is a change maker because it is what it is the greatest gift to be able to give. And that if we are teaching young people empathy, if teens are in are building change making, uh, then everyone has a role to play and problems, solutions will outrun problems. Uh, thank you, Diana. Um, Cheryl, if I may turn to you uh, the, with a similar question, what is your redefinition of success and, and how do we achieve that through our change makers? Uh, it's a, a big question. And again, I'll sort of end where I started around sort of the centrality of power, right? Um, and I've, you know, been a practitioner in the field of social innovation, but in a very specific lane and way at the intersection of justice, right? So those of us in the Echo and Green ecosystem have studied deeply um, sort of all of the, the lessons and triumphs and successes that have come out of, you know, the great tradition of community organizing. And we just have to look at, you know, everyone from Saul Alinsky and IAF to ACORN, to Southern Tenant Farm Worker Union, to the Nonpartisan League, um, and all of the things that great community organizers think about, whether it's deeply investing in leadership, 
um, mobilizing young people as next gen leaders, collaboration as a form of power building, and the notion of direct action against systems that are oppressive and marginalizing communities um, are being reimagined and redefined through the lens of social innovation um, as it comes of age. Um, and this idea of um, the power of women, you know, I love so much of Karima's um, imagery. And I was sort of thinking about the process of how diamonds are forged from pure carbon under extreme pressure. Well, that's what change agents, that's how change agents show up in the world, right? Sort of their radical imagination is forged as they're trying to close the distance between aspiration and ideal and realities that marginalize them. And tonight, you know, at the Skull World Forum, we're going to hear from two badass women, Latasha Brown, represented Williams, who embody what that radical imagination looks like at, at the center of change. And to me, that kind of investment in those types of leaders and social innovators that are represented in communities like Ashoka and Echoing Green, that's the long-term payoff. That's what success looks like. As always, Cheryl Dorsey, we need some more diamonds in the room. Clearly, we've got a Shoko Schwab Foundation and Echoing Green Diamonds already, and let's find more of them. Uh, and there are a few in the making, I'm sure, uh, especially after this conversation. Um, Karima, I might turn to you and uh, might ask you to paint an imagery for us uh, as well. What is your redefinition of success and, and how would you hope to see it being achieved? Can you hear me well? Because I'm struggling a lot with the sound at the moment. We can hear you. It's a little patchy, but we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, because I can barely hear you. So I, I'm, I'm hoping I got the question right. Hmm. So what success is telling us? Success is talking about an outcome. An end. But life is not an end, it's a process. And, and how can we be in that life, alive, feeling alive? Coming back to life, feeling that energy, the same that you feel that when you're in love, right? It's like oh, everything is sharper, everything is more beautiful, everything. How can we feel that? Hmm? How can we? But isn't that a process? So isn't this whole story about the story and not where it's taking us, but about learning together to co-create the conditions, the emergence of the ecosystems, the social ecosystems of our societal harmony, learning together to co-create the conditions for the emergence of the ecosystems of the human flourishing, learning together to be what we are. So it's autotelic. The process in itself has meaning in itself, has no objective but that. And then we're mindful, we in the present, we stop thinking in the future. Let's be in the future, now. And that changes everything. It changes how we measure, it changes our whole idea of how we control. Actually, we might even become a humanizing society where our schools, our organizing organizations, our systems reflect the beauty of our humanity. As powerful as I was hoping for it to be. Um, and I love what you said about success not as an outcome, but success as a process. And especially what you said about centering love, connection, and relationship um, at the heart of success. So that, that's beautiful. So, thank you, Karima. Wow, I'm, I'm, this is such a treat for me to be here. I'm just very honored with all of you. Um, Gisela, last but not least, um, you know, I'd love to, you've so much you've been so enlightening and i yeah you have been and i'd love to ask you the same question what is your redefinition of success and how do you work to achieve that i i think i think uh, we should measure su success uh looking at 
if what we are doing is producing, promoting, contributing for a common good, we need to start perceiving the others and not just ourselves, also as a social entrepreneur. So the way I pay the salaries of my collaborators, what, what is the effect those salaries have on their lives? Are they able to live a, a life with dignity? The way I, I promote, I, I, I help the people I, I, I help, what is the consequence? Not just for those people, but for the whole community. For instance, once I was going to a slum, and, and people living in the slum said, oh, you are from train, right? They say, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Train is just good for those who you treat. I mean, you're not good for the others, for instance. So even when we are thinking that we are doing some good, we might not be aware of the totality. So a definition is uh, how, how, how much you are able to look at this totality, to, the, to this integrality as a, the ecosystem, the person, and, and how we are actually contributing to this, to produce, to promote this common good. Because this is actual system change. Because then we are actually looking to the totality, to the integrality, and contributing to change something. And I finish because <laughs> we are done. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will never be able to encapsulate this conversation. So I'm just going to say a huge thank you to Diana, Cheryl, Karima and Gisela for being here. Thank you so much to Skoll and Catalyst 2030. This was an honor. I am very, I'm privileged to be here. And thank you again for sharing your time with us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.